So let's begin the first session. Ron Land is the, sorry, Ron Land is the moderator for the session, so I'm going to turn this over to Ron for the next hour and a half or so. Thank you, Dushi, and I also want to welcome everyone here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Ron Land. You probably know me better as the guy who's been filling up your email with junk mail, <laughs> urging you to be here, and I'm glad to see it work to some degree. So uh, again, welcome. Uh, we've got a lot to cover today, so I don't want to take much time. I think there's, uh, I do need to do a little bit of bookkeeping. We have these panels. They're going to be discussing those things which I think are going to be the major influences and the things that dictate how technology advances in the next 10 years. And so we have a format we're going to follow. We want to hear from these people, but we also want to give you a chance to interact with them. So what we're going to do, each panel will have what we've called an introductory speaker. And that speaker's purpose will be to, to some degree, frame the discussion of the panel, but then to offer his or her perspectives on those issues that they think are key issues in terms of technology in the next 10 years. You do have a list of kind of the questions and topics that we provided the panels some five, six weeks ago as uh, thinking points, so you have an idea of what they've been thinking about. Uh, following the introductory speaker, each of the other panel members will be given a chance to provide their insight based on the perspective from the organization they're with. And then we will, uh, my job as moderator is to keep us on time so that when they're done, we will have at least 15 or 20 minutes for you to interact with the panelists, ask questions, uh, make comments, whatever. The idea is we want to learn from these people the things that we need to know in order to move technology forward over the next decade. So with that, let me invite the first panel up. While they're coming up, uh, there is a short bio of each of the panel members in your brochure, so I'm not going to read that. But once they're here, I will give them a brief introduction and we'll get them started. For convenience, let me start at uh, the far end of the table, my left, your right. Uh, our first panel member is Mark Stratton. Mark is a member and industry relations manager, manufacturing education and research for the Society of Mechanical Engineers, or Manufacturing Engineers, excuse me, Mark. Uh, next to him, I believe, is Thomas Kearney. Thomas Kearney is uh, general manager of operations at Allegheny Power Company, one of the uh, large utilities in this part of the country. And next to him, I think we have uh, Richard Dodaro. Richard is the Vice President of Engineering for Shaw Power Group, one of the major, uh, I think, A&E companies, construction companies in the, uh, in the world, in fact. And then uh, the next panel member is uh, Mr. Reginald Brown. Uh, Reginald is Director of the Office of Modernization and HR Line of Business for the United States Office of Personnel Management. And then finally, our lead speaker for this panel, Sitting next to me on the left here is Ms. Emily DeRocco. Emily is president of the Manufacturing Institute and senior vice president of the National Association of Manufacturers. And with that, Emily, the podium is yours. Do I get training on that? Push right and left and forward and back. I can do that. Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Well, for those of you who didn't join us at 3 a.m., it was warm not raining outside. <laughs> at 3.45, it was getting colder and raining once again. And at about quarter to seven this morning, it was um, also raining. It's been a lovely night at the Nittany Lion Inn, <laughs> reminiscent of the ones I spent here when I was a student, um, except I was having more fun outside at the time. Um, thank you, Ron, for um, inviting me to join this uh, wonderful panel. It's always good to return to Penn State and to Pennsylvania because this is home for me. Uh, particularly delightful to be returning for an event that's as important as today's um, because it really uh, brings real value to the people I now serve and that would be America's manufacturers. I also do have to say that it's a bit intimidating to be in a room full of engineers and engineering technologists because I know you are the people who make things that make this country great. I, on the other hand, am a lawyer, and we do our best to thwart all progress in that regard. <laughs> so, how we doing? The heart of this session is 
clearly going to be when we get to the dialogue with the panelists. But um, I, Ron and Dushi asked me to join you this morning uh, to perhaps establish a little context for the conversation, clearly from the manufacturer's perspective. And um, I thought I'd do that by addressing six key drivers that I see as um, actually requiring change in engineering and engineering technology education in the months and years ahead. Interactions that I've had with manufacturing leaders around the country, and in fact, you know too, this is true around the globe, have helped me conclude that manufacturing, engineering, education, must quickly adjust to the renaissance we're seeing in manufacturing worldwide. So I feel safe in acting as an envoy from America's manufacturing community because I've been asked to generally spread the word that today's graduates often are not prepared to step into a plant and be productive and contributive um, in short order. In fact, to become effective employees Many of our companies report that new hires require three to five years of in-company training before they're comfortable with them. So my sense is that most of us in this room, based on the theme of ETLI, agree that at some level, engineering education and engineering technology education um, are changing and need to change. So let me present these drivers, as I call them, to both engineering and engineering technology education. Um, I, they apply, I think, to both. But I also want to say that it is my personal impression that the engineering technology curriculum, faculty, and administration is responding more rapidly and more effectively to these drivers than our traditional engineering education programs. So um, I'll be anxious to hear if that's your perspective as well. Um, driver one might seem a little strange because it's outside the context of either the university environment initially or the manufacturer, but it is critically important. Too few young people are choosing to pursue engineering education or a manufacturing career. And if they do choose it, the education and training pipeline from which they come is absolutely inadequate. This fact becomes particularly critical when we consider innovation and its importance to our nation's competitiveness. I'm gonna visit innovation in just a few minutes, but clearly you and I both know that innovation requires that we have an educated and skilled workforce so that they can adapt to new technologies and workplace changes very rapidly. And as we become ever more dependent on the innovative thinking of manufacturing leaders, engineers, and technologists. We're finding ourselves desperately short of them. And that's because the pipeline to prepare new engineers, actually all manufacturing workers, is inadequate and young folks aren't interested in us anyway. The Manufacturing Institute, NAM and Deloitte, joined last June in the first annual index of the public perception about manufacturing. This is important because Americans clearly were found to believe that manufacturing is the top industry of importance to our economic and national security. Yet, the report noted that Americans would not choose it for a career and would not choose the education pathway to that career, and they would not encourage their children to seek that pathway either. So beyond the reality of our tarnished reputation um, in terms of inhibiting young people to look to manufacturing as a career is another impediment that you and I share. Even if we attract them, too few are prepared to tackle the educational pathway or the career pathway. And that appears to be a consequence of the diminished importance of STEM education in our K-12 system. And, and this is most important to me this morning is a prime message I wanna deliver. It's also as a result of too few opportunities for applied learning in our environments. Young folks simply lack the foundational skills in math, science, and technology, and the opportunity to apply them in an educational setting, to even consider 
entering the engineering and engineering technologies curriculum and careers in manufacturing today. So we have a serious pipeline problem and an incumbent worker problem uh, that, quite frankly, as university leaders, you can't afford not to address in your um, desire to become more responsive to the market and to the needs of your graduates. Driver number two, industry is so exasperated with this situation that there, we are now requiring nationally portable, industry-recognized skills certifications to drive education reform at all levels, K-12, community colleges, four-year colleges and universities, and graduate degree programs. Why are manufacturers addressing this? Let's remind ourselves of the challenges. In a nutshell, and interestingly, the dean mentioned this as well, as a nation, actually, we have peaked in terms of the number of high school graduates and the number of graduates will be declining for some years to come. Second, the retirement slowed during this recession. They will pick up again once people write their economic ships and we expect to see a landslide out the door sometime soon. And last, our world competitors, all of whom operate within this smaller borderless world, understand that talent like products move freely in the smaller world in which we all compete. At the same time, our industry is noting that there are 88 million workers currently in the workforce that face huge education barriers, one of three, quite frankly. They either don't have a high school diploma, they have limited post-secondary college experience, and a full five million or more don't speak English very well. So there's their incumbent workforce, their pipeline, and last but not least, an industry that recognizes every worker they hire is about a million dollar investment for their company. And if the education system is not delivering the technicians, technologists, and engineers, then they had to do something about it. Well, our response from the National Association was to launch on March 4th something called the NAM Endorsed Manufacturing Skills Certification System. And our purpose was to actually drive industry-recognized skills certifications into your educational pathways in engineering and engineering technology. This is where I hoped it would be up because it's going to be easier to understand. Is it going to come back up? <laughs> okay, we'll go back. Um, uh, let me briefly explain the skills certification system. We'll see how good I am at doing it without the visual. I, unfortunately, am a visual learner, so I will understand if this is difficult for you to, um, to um, visualize and learn in this setting. We took something called the Advanced Manufacturing Competency and Skill Model that was developed officially with the U.S. Department of Labor and Education a few years ago, and it was developed by manufacturers for manufacturers. And it set out a pyramid of competencies and skills from entry-level workers through graduate degree to engineers that were required for an employee in any of those categories to be successful in entry level and then advancement in careers in manufacturing. We have focused on and deployed the first set of these skills certifications that address personal effectiveness skills, um, general foundational academic skills, general workplace skills, and finally, general manufacturing skills that uh, are now being deployed through two-year associate degree programs in 22 states across the country. Basically, these are skill and, con oh, I see pictures. This is the advanced uh, manufacturing competency model. Basically, what we're saying that is if a graduate has these four tiers of skills and competencies certified by assessment, they will be prepared for entry-level jobs in 14 sectors of our manufacturing economy. And we are working on version 2.0, which will move to the industry-recognized, nationally portable skills certifications in sector-specific and occupation-specific work. 
Um, in order to put this skill certification system together and integrate it into degree programs of study, we partnered with five critical organizations. ACT's National Career Readiness uh, Certification, the Manufacturing Skill Standards Council, Certified Production Technician, the National Institute of Metalworking Skills, Machining and Metal Forming, American Welding Society Certified Welders, and Society of Manufacturing Engineers, Technologists, and will include their technician series. So what I was saying with these stackable industry recognized credentials that align to career pathways, we are aligning them, mapping them to the degree programs in high school, community college, and in four-year college and university programs. Uh, those are the 22 states in which we're deploying now. Uh, so it is a move that industry is driving for true education reform. I think there are huge implications for the engineering technologist program. I think Penn State believes that too. And so we're proud to actually partner with them. So that was driver number two, again, aligning to nationally portable industry recognized skill certifications against which companies are going to recruit, screen, and hire. Driver number three, uh, obviously our engineers in manufacturing and our technologists um, are fun facing a much bigger job today than they ever have before. Their responsibilities within the companies are broader and they require new skills. In today's plan, your graduates are now required to be part of the whole manufacturing team, including working with the sales team, the customer service team, the supplier teams, distribution, communication, problem solving, and knowing the general business model as well. Uh, SME and their educational foundation has identified the competency gaps that are um, industry representatives have identified. I think it's critically important and Mark may address those in his remarks. Driver four. Uh, this is the increased infusion of technology across all of those 14 sectors in manufacturing that I think drives significant change and probably, quite frankly at the outset, was the genesis of the engineering technology programs to address this infusion of technology into our manufacturing economy. So some would say that maybe requires little comment, but there are three key points that I would like to make about this. The first is that I'm seeing a huge move to the virtualization of the product uh, lifecycle management, and particularly the use of modeling and simulation requirements for everything from bidding to global contracts, to procurement, and accelerating, of course, design to market. The concepts of product lifecycle management and manufacturing execution systems are pushing our manufacturers, primes and suppliers alike, more and more into the virtual world. The second is clearly something you recognize because our talent development has to keep pace with the emerging technologies that are filtering at an accelerated pace into all manufacturing, including artificial intelligence, robotics, biomanufacturing, recycling, the list goes on and on. Keeping pace with that change in terms of your talent development is an extraordinary challenge. And third is a personal passion of mine and one we are working on at the national level in a big way. And that is connecting manufacturers to the power and potential of high performance supercomputing. This nation has a huge asset in their supercomputing capability and a lack of talent uh, in our industry to actually access it and use it for the problem solving and innovation that um, the, the power could bring in our global marketplace. Um, the fifth driver uh, the dean also mentioned, and this is critically important because it is the need for your technologists and engineers broadly to work comfortably and routinely in a highly innovative environment. 
My chief concern these days is that the U.S. innovation advantage is slipping away. And we recently issued a report in partnership with the Boston Consulting Group entitled The Innovation Imperative in Manufacturing, How the U.S. Can Restore Its Edge. It speaks to the importance of innovation and how education impacts the companies, the regions, the states, and this nation's ability to compete. Unfortunately, it also confirmed what many of us already knew. The U.S. is no longer the world innovation leader in our international benchmarking. The U.S. is now eighth among all nations. As a country, we have sustained our productivity growth of the past by injecting and using the computer to more effectively design, produce, and distribute. Well, we're about at the end of that advantage as competitor nations are, in fact, using exactly the same strategy. So our future productivity increases and our ability to continue to be the world leader in manufacturing rest completely on innovation new and improved designs, better processes, faster design to market timing, and more innovative human resource management are all part of the skills and talents our leaders, our technologists, and our engineers have to bring to the manufacturing industry and our economy today. And finally, the sixth and final driver is the pressure that companies face by engaging in the world market. Your graduates today must understand globalization and be able to engage in the seamless design, development, and manufacture of a product worldwide. The reliance on and integration of design and manufacturing services from offshore companies are standard and routine in business today, from the smallest plant to the global giants. So engineers and technologists are required to hold a big view of their world market, to know where exactly their company fits and what competitive advantages they can and should leverage, to have knowledge of international finance and capitalization, to be comfortable with the controls and regulatory systems of other countries, and perhaps even to speak a foreign language. So those are the six drivers that I would identify broadly, nationally, even globally, that confront our um, academe in assuring that the educational pathway for engineering technologists and engineers, quite frankly, are beginning to address. We have little time to address these challenges, and they're huge. At the same time, we begin to address them with huge advantages, what has been and continues to be the world's best engineering education system. So let's get about the business of making the modifications, being adaptable, and most importantly, responding to industry who in fact need and will be the, the final landing place for your products, your graduates. So with that, Ron, I'd like to move on to the rest of the panel. The one thing we didn't do is establish an order for speakers, so I'm going to be arbitrary and just go right down the panel here. So our next speaker again is uh, Reginald Brown from the U.S. Office of Personal Management. And uh, as a little bit of background, those of you who are familiar with the federal job classifications, those are under the authority of uh, the, the U.S. Office of Personal Management. So Reginald, the podium is yours. Thank you and good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here on this morning. Um, as the Director for the Office of Modernization and Human Resources line of business, it's my challenge to marry technology with the human uh, resources requirements that we have for the federal government. So when Ron first asked for me to speak, I was very clear on the technology end of the terminology, but the engineering portion of it seemed kind of strange to bring the engineering and technology together. So I talked with um, both of our classification specialists within OPM, and we also talked out to some of our customers, um, the Army Corps of Engineers and, and the like. And 
I found out within the federal government there's not a wide understanding of engineering technology. We have engineers and we have engineering technicians. We have those who do the research, which we call the, the engineers, and we have those who do the application, which we call technicians. So when we were trying to respond to engineering technology to identify uh, people within the federal government with that type of classification, currently there is none. So today we're going to boldly try to go where we, we've never gone before and try to get with you in a dialogue because that dialogue is important for affecting how we go about and change the classification standards within the, within the federal government relating to engineering technology and also to give an appreciation for our stakeholders, which are the agencies, so they can come into the Office of Personnel Management and kind of lead that dialogue. The dialogue is in three um, different constituencies. First, it's with the um, needs that we get from congressional type influence. The second is what we are, are receiving from our agencies. And the third is what we receive from our industry partners. And so today, what I want to do is to try to give you a little insight into the Office of Personnel Management approach for how we go about and determine the actual classifications uh, for different types of job series, give you an, a lot of information also as well as where engineering titling and descriptions fit within the federal government, and then it kind of open up with some, a couple of questions on where we see the next steps. Okay, I guess if I press this. Okay, so the outline is again response to, is response to the topics talk about our current federal um, engineering agency employee information and give you a glimpse of, of what we have, uh, some of our historical trends, and then allow times for question and answers. Uh, last night, uh, when we were talking about the time required, I said I probably need about five to six minutes, so we'll see how things go for this morning. Okay, um, the question that was provided to us was, again, was what was the process for establishing job classifications within the federal agencies for engineering? And what happens is that OPM goes about placing positions in, in, in uh, proper categories and grades based on Title uh, 51, Title 5 of Chapter 51 of the Federal Code. And what happens is that right now our current director, John Barry, has uh, decided to look across the HR spectrum for reform. So this is a good time for us to be engaging in this type of discussion. So what we do is we have um, an annual work plan for standards development throughout the federal government. Engineering is one field as well as others. And so what we do is we get quarterly meetings from the chief um, classification specialists of each of the agencies and determine what the priority series that need to be addressed. And then prior to issuing that classification standard, what we do is we kind of post it um, out on what we call the OPM's classif classification listserv and then allow the public to comment on that uh, standard before it's finally adopted. And then once it's adopted, we go out and we implement that, and, and then within 12 months from release, it's promulgated throughout the uh, federal government. Um, where we stand as far as engineering positions is that in 1999, OPM first um, notified agencies about developing a job series standard for professional engineering work. So between 1999 and 2002, we collected information from our 15 major agencies to develop that standard. Not a lot of work was done since 1992. Um, then about five years or six years later, we took up the, the information and the effort from that point and started working on the standard. The primary lead agencies were the Department of Defense and also the uh, uh, NASA as far as testing the draft standard that we had developed. And then finally, we came out just recently, I, you know, I, was, I would say, in November with what we call the, the Job Family Series for Engineering and Architecture Group, which is the federal government. That's where engineering falls is in the 800 series. As I alluded to a little bit earlier, the uh, classification engineering technology uh, technologist really is, is not a meaningful um, or official uh, position title within the federal government. I know many of you are probably sad to hear that, but um, at this point, what we've done is we've taken the standard approach. 
In the federal government, we have a professional series, and then for all the applied um, use of that series, we, have, we, we label them with the term technician. So if, you, if you're a CPA, you're an accountant, and if you work in accounting without having a professional certification, then you're accounting technician. If you are, um, you know, receive your training in um, computer science, you're a computer specialist. If not, you're a computer technician. So, so we use that same methodology and approach for the engineering field. So what we have is we have engineers, and then we have engineering technicians. So that's how we uh, separate the two within the federal government at this point. The, 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 the takeaway is that this dialogue right now, we have not really been engaging in sufficiently. So to incorporate the uh, engineering technology or technologist series, we would have to have a definitive, um, as I think was talked about earlier, educational background and skill sets in order to come up with that type of a designation for that. From a federal perspective, what is the outlook for um, two and four years? As it was alluded to before, we do have a problem with uh, people nearing retirement age, and so it looks very well for the federal government. In fact, some people say that we will have far more cubicles for those uh, engineers who want to have a cubicle and come and work. Uh, we, we have plenty of cubicles uh, uh, available for the future. Uh, the key skills and capabilities, uh, most of our skills are actually related, again, to the classifications that I talked about a little bit earlier, primarily engineering and engineering technician. So what I wanted to do was just to run through those so you can have some visibility into those type of uh, capabilities and actual competencies that we have within the federal government. So let's begin. In the field of, in the field of engineering and construction, these are some of the, um, I'm not going to read them all, but I'm going to leave them up there for you a chance to glance at those. These are the competencies that we're looking for engineering and construction for the, for the most part. Uh, for uh, engineering and civil engineering, you see the two, uh, mapping and, and storm sewer design. Um, construction, schedule, uh, schedule performance management. I'm not going to read all of those, but again, engineering, cost engineering, engineering, dam and levy, and levy uh, safety. In the federal government, we have a lot of what you call s uh, specifics about what is required for different positions. So in some instances, um, you may have a general uh, distinction, but if you don't have special competencies within those subgroups, you may not be qualified for that position. And it goes on. Uh, engineering, geospatial, those are some of the competency groups that we're looking at for those. Um, engineering, geotechnical engineering, just some of those. Engineering, hydraulic engineering. Um, again, did, did this thing work? Okay. Um, engineering, structural engineering, again, some of the competencies looking under there. Value engineering, what we have there. Installation management, and this is what with a lot of our MILCON project uh, development. Operations and maintenance engineering. Um, planning and economics, it's, 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 it's part of uh, the skill sets that are needed in some of our job uh, responsibilities planning environmental, planning, uh, plan formulation. And these jobs are, all, again, all lumped in that 800 series between engineering and engineering technician for the federal government. Um, civil works planning, research and development. Uh, this is, again, for flood risk management. And, and these are the type of detailed special competencies, again, as we're looking for for many of these jobs uh, announcements that are being posted. Okay, uh, the next thing I wanted to provide was just a little glimpse at the federal government itself because I believe we are one of the largest employers of engineers in the United States. Um, and I'm going to go by agency and also give you a count of how many that we currently have on board in those particular agencies so you can kind of see. And, and, and the average, the average, well, well, again, the average number of years that person is in that series. So we have five people as the average of those five, of course. Okay, so um, then these are the agencies, American Battle Monuments Commission, 
three engineers, and you see that, architectural transportation and barriers. You also see the different agencies that we have, Armed Forces, Retirement Home, um, Commission of Fine Arts, Department of Agriculture, and, and in ranking in size, Department of Agriculture is number seven in the employment of engineering, engineers. Um, Department of, of Defense. What happens, Department of Defense is, is, is captured what we call the Office of Secretary of Defense, and then the different Army, Air Force, and Navy, they're all independent. So when you see the Department of Defense is number nine, it's talking about the Department of Defense, Office of the Secretary of Defense portion. So that's number nine. Number eight, the Department of Energy. Um, and they have about 3,000 or so engineering and engineering technicians. Again, the numbers here, number three, uh, United States Air Force. Uh, number two, Department of the Army, the Army Corps of Engineers, most of you should be familiar with that. Number seven, Department of Interior. And surprising, uh, most of you should recognize the Department of Navy is actually the number one employer of engineers within the federal government. Um, Department of Transportation ranks number five, and the Environmental Protection Agency is number 10. <coughs> Again, uh, different other agencies, number four, NASA. And our, our totals there, we have approximately 125,551 engineers and engineering technicians currently on board within the federal government. Um, and just to give you a little glimpse of the, of the trends, um, going back through them, and this is for the last three years, of, of course, the red denotes a decrease in the number of, of engineers. So if you look at most of the, as, as, as say for the future, for most of the agencies, they are growing in a number and their need for engineers. Some are, are going down, like the Department of Agriculture, but it's not a significant drop uh, in, in that agency, as well as the Department of Commerce. Um, Department of Air Force, um, that's, a, that's kind of, you know, interesting that they are reducing their numbers. If you see over from, from 2006, 2007, and 2008 that they are decreasing their reliance on engineers um, and Department of Interior, but everyone else is either staying where they are, increasing the number of engineers and engineering technicians they're looking for within their agencies. GSA. General Service Administration, and then the others, as you can see. Okay, that brings us to again a wrap up. The major, the major um, items that I just would like to speak to on this morning is that we really need to hear from you, and we really need to gain, gain more visibility, and how that visibility is actually developed is by interacting with, the, I would say, one of the top 10 players, which is the Department of Defense, Army, Air Force, Navy, uh, NASA. Those are our big um, agencies, getting with them um, to actually start articulate what that need is. Because uh, again, we just completed the, the job family standards for engineering. And if we need to change that, those will be the primary players in any types of changes that should come for the future. Uh, and continuing on the, uh, the dialogue. Again, when I went out and surveyed the different agencies, there was not a great familiarity to what, what was distinctly meant by the engineering technology or uh, engineering technologists and what was the skill set that that was uh, purporting as opposed to the engineer or the engineering technician. So what this all translates is that one of our goals at OPM, again, is to make the federal government one of the model employers. And so we need to be able to have that understanding so we can go out and, again, tailor our recruiting efforts and bring on those people into the federal government. And also to help, in the larger sense, the challenges is that we have some great uh, challenges within the federal government that require for us to collaborate with different other countries and, and resolving those type of things. So what we're looking for. Um, in many instances is, is engineering for tomorrow, when I was talking to the core, those people that are able to take that educational background and also have those soft skills 
of communication, of teamwork, being able to integrate those to produce the results that we need for the future. The government has done a lot in its past for, as in NASA putting folks on the moon and all, all the different types of large scale um, engineering products that we see throughout the, comp uh, the country, but the quest right now is for innovation and we are um, challenged to accomplish that not in a, a silo of the United States in many, in many instances, but to come together collaboratively with other nations and getting those type of things um, completed. So again, our goal is to be the, the model employer within the United States, and again, to bring the right people with the right skills into the right jobs, doing the right things for the right outcomes. So with that, I thank you for this morning. Thank you, Reggie. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Thomas Kearney with Allegheny Energy System, and uh, he'll talk with a little bit different perspective on engineering and technology. So, Thomas. Thank you, Ron, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, just so that you know, if the lights go out, it's not my fault. Uh, Penn State has their own system here, so uh, you know, just kind of keep that in mind. With, with Murphy hitting everything that we've done so far, I'm kind of glad I didn't bring a set of slides. Uh, I'm going to know what would happen to it. But in Allegheny Energy, uh, we are a, a, a fully functional uh, electric utility. We generate, transmit, and distribute electricity. Um, our industry has gone through multiple changes over the last decade or so and uh, presented many, many challenges to us. And those challenges, if you took a look at our organization, you would find out we are heavily loaded with engineers. Uh, we allow a few uh, lawyers on, on hand just to keep us out of trouble, and a few accountants to, to watch our dollars. But really, we, we hire a lot of engineers and a lot of engineering technicians. Uh, at Allegheny, we do differentiate very clearly between engineers and engineering technicians. To get an engineer position in our, our uh, company, you must have the engineer uh, curriculum uh, four years, and, uh, and, and it's very, very clear. We differentiate um, starting pay, starting uh, entry-level type positions between engineers and technicians. Now, on the vol volume side, we hire a lot more engineering technicians than we do engineers. Uh, on, on my staff uh, here in the north central region, I have uh, probably 15 technicians and uh, one or two engineers. So it, it's where we, we hire a lot of technicians. Um, they come in, and, and what we're doing with the, the technicians versus the engineers is, is much like uh, Rich was talking about. Our engineers are, are more into the, the theoretical, the calculations, the, the um, uh, more intricate problem solving whereas our technicians do basically everything else. Uh, our local technicians here will, will contact customers. If you apply for electric service, one of our technicians comes out to meet you. He will design the power line to go to your, your business or your home, and uh, he will also troubleshoot that power line when problems happen on the, on the line. So they have to be multi-talented, uh, multi-skilled, even though we hire predominantly EETs for these positions, if they're not very strong mechanically, they really can't carry out the job. The job is maybe even more mechanical than electrical, uh, which seems funny for an electric utility business, but, but it is true. Much of our failures are mechanical failures on our system more so than electrical failures. Okay. So we differentiate very clearly between the, the two. And probably the biggest differentiation between the, the engineer versus the technician is the amount of math and the amount of theory that they get. The, the technician gets a lot more hands-on. They're a lot better at, at physically in the field solving problems than most of our engineers are. Engineers are very intelligent, but they are much more theoretical than they are applications in hands-on. Okay. Once you're through the initial hiring, um, things can level out a good bit. Uh, promotional opportunities for uh, technical graduates are every bit as good as the engineers with one exception, and that is that for the most part we don't allow them to, prom to be promoted into managers of engineering departments. Beyond that, uh, as long as they, they have that degree, uh, they're uh, very capable and uh, looked at very strongly to move into management type positions. 
We run into the same problems. Rich says once you move into a management position for very long, you tend to become obsolete uh, as an engineer, and uh, that becomes a problem. So it's kind of a one-time commitment to move into management, uh, which is unfortunately what I did many years ago, and, and then consider myself to be one of those obsolete engineers. Certainly, what we're looking for in technical graduates is very similar to, to Rich's. We need strong computer skills. Uh, we're not as, as um, uh, particular that, that they know the specific um, uh, programs and stuff that we use because many of them are industry specific and uh, are customized once you get into our various businesses. So uh, as long as they have good general computer skills and no fear of computers, then, then you're more than qualified to come in to uh, Allegheny. But possibly the most important thing for us is troubleshooting. Uh, if you can't analyze data and, and troubleshoot what's going on, then that, that's really what their main function is, at least in the field operations. Okay. Uh, so a clear logical thought process is, is absolutely critical. Anyone can generate data. It takes a good person to analyze that data and, and come up with root causes and then solutions to those, those root causes of so we can get our system back up and running. Uh, verbal and written communication is absolutely necessary. Uh, it's amazing to me how poor some of our engineers are when it comes to writing, especially correspondence with customers. Um, it, it is uh, just so amazing to me that I, I've, for the past uh, 15 years, I volunteered to come here to Penn State and speak to the technical writing courses. And, and tried to show some of the engineers and, and technicians exactly what it is that we do at Allegheny in writing so that they can understand a little bit more important how, how important it is to learn those skills. Okay. Um, interpersonal skills is, is absolutely essential. So much of our interaction is with customers and or on teams in, inside the company. And um, engineers are notorious for not being the most personable people. And uh, uh, we, we really do have to look for that when we are interviewing uh, engineers and technicians. So uh, I understand that most of you have uh, teamwork built into your curriculum, and I encourage you to continue that. That is absolutely essential. Everything done in our organization is done by teamwork and, and various teams. Uh, along that same line, uh, some of the other technical um, problem-solving tools that are out there, such as Six Sigma, and, and total quality and things like that are very critical to our operations. So I encourage you to consider adding that to your curriculum as well. Uh, the other thing that, that we require out of most of our technicians and really our engineers as well is to be self-motivated and self-directional. Uh, we don't have a lot of layers of supervision in our organization, so we need folks that, that can recognize a problem, solve it without having someone always there to point them in the right direction. So they have to be very strong uh, leaders of themselves and as well as others. Okay. Um, one other distinction that, that we see is, is in the project management field. We would like very much to see our technicians being able to lead projects and, and lead project teams and that, that involves a lot more skills than just grabbing a bunch of workers and getting them to build something or fix something. A lot of our teams have to uh, evaluate various options and uh, do economic analysis as well as, as technical analysis. Most of our technicians are very good with the technical part of it, uh, but they fall a little short on the economic analysis. So uh, another area for you to consider adding to your curriculum if it's not there already. Um, Rich talked about uh, professional certification, and professional certification in our group is um, not something that we look at very closely for the technicians. Uh, for our engineers, many of them are, are encouraged to get uh, licensed, but really for our technicians, we don't uh, differentiate uh, anything special for a technician that becomes a, a certified engineer. Uh, that keeps them still in the, in the uh, technician rank of, of classification. Okay. Um, the uh, challenges in our organization and our industry are phenomenal. I'm sure everybody has heard the uh, advertisements and even in the, the recent election we talked about the smart grid 
and how we're integrating various um, generation windmills and, and uh, photovoltaic and things like that. Our industry, is, if anything, is going to get more technical in coming years. So I think that the opportunities in the industry and in our company alone are going to be fantastic. We face the same aging workforce that everybody else does, but beyond that, the, the complexity of our industry is just going to expand tremendously over the next five to ten years. So I think that uh, we have a lot of opportunity in our industry to take some of your graduates and, and move them into, uh, into working for not only Allegheny Power, but really in the power industry. And with that, I will conclude, and, and hopefully you will have questions for us afterwards, and I look forward to uh, addressing those. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Tom. And uh, last, uh, but certainly not least, I said we started with uh, manufacturing. Let me bring uh, Mark Stratton up, who's with the Society of Manufacturing Engineers. Mark. You can tie up the loose ends. Solve this problem. The technologists are problem solvers. That's what we're here for. Actually, uh, thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Um, I have to give a shout out. We have an SME member here that's partially responsible for SME and myself being here um, as a membership consultant. Dave Bastel's in the Pittsburgh area. So while you're here at the conference and you have questions about SME and the like, Dave, raise your hand. Uh, he'd, he'd love to get to know you and he'll even, uh, he's probably got one of those membership applications in his pocket. Uh, he's nodding, he does uh, indeed, thank you. Um, why is manufacturing important? Well, I think we all understand if you're really going to generate wealth, um, you have to make something, mine it, farm it, whatever. It's the true generator of wealth. And where have we seen a lot of innovations recently? Certainly it's been um, in innovative ways to generate a lot of money for those who are collecting the gold, uh, but it's not been... Uh, as recognized in manufacturing that all of this kind of innovations that have occurred in manufacturing, while it has reduced the number of people employed in manufacturing, let's think about something else with respect to employment in manufacturing industries. Um, I don't want to ask by a show of hands, certainly, but if you look at the graduates, recent and former graduates of both engineering and technology programs, you would probably maybe have to think about it for a while, but you may agree, perhaps even reluctantly, that the majority of those folks go to work in manufacturing industries. Anybody that disagrees with that? Okay, so there's yet another importance to the manufacturing flavor that, that we've been talking about here. Um, the numbers, if it depends on how you count them, of course, and where you get the numbers from. But, you know, years ago we used to cite that it was not just a majority, but, you know, 70, 80 percent of those that were employed in engineering and in the in engineering technology, technologist, technician roles. Uh, we're in industry and we're in manufacturing industries. So we always like to say, well, how are you getting your future, uh, your future, your graduates ready for their future employment. Uh, so just some small points. Um, I'm going to assume one of these buttons. On the right. On the right. Okay. Um, just a couple of observations that I can uh, add to the conversation. Um, a June survey of 2,500 small and medium-sized businesses uh, came up with some attributes of what they considered important in their future workforce to the success of their manufacturing enterprise. And collectively, I think we've all said similar things about being focused on innovation that really relates to what your customers need. Uh, engaged workforce, you know, at one point we used to describe um, the result of Henry Ford's contribution to mass production was you could put your brain leave it by the door when you entered the factory because you really didn't need to know very much. As a matter of fact, they had set up manufacturing jobs so well that you didn't even need to speak English to learn to do your job in a manufacturing environment. Do you think times have changed? <laughs> 
And do you think that the technological um, competencies required of anybody in any manufacturing environment have changed? And do you think that we've gotten rid of the smokestack industries and gotten into some of the high-tech stuff uh, requiring some advanced manufacturing competencies, of course? Um, so engaging people uh, who are part of the process of improving the processes and that those employed by that company become a superior process. Last week I talked to a membership consultant in uh, New York and, and got on to something that he mentioned uh, of value to you folks here and he said, you know, he said, I had to bid on a job at 40% less than what I did a year ago. Same job, same contract. But the company said, if you want our business, you got to do it for 40% less. Can you do your job at a 40% less cost and ensure the quality of your product from your system? And he says, the reason I was able to do that was I did go out and find some new technology and how the cutting tool was designed and how fast it could go through the material for the part we were making that I shaved 30% off the time that part was in our plant, got some other savings together, and I bid on the job to keep it, but I didn't lose money on it. Now, that's a real problem solver. Did he have an engineering degree? I don't think so, quite honestly. I do have to ask him about that. But that example was one of many about, you know, part of uh, the success in the future is being able to achieve some uh, improvements. Um, the supply chain management and collaboration, I found it interesting they used the word collaboration um, because up and down the supply chain, this was one of the competency gaps um, 10 years ago that SME had identified when it looked at what the gaps were in the education of graduates. Supply chain was mentioned and now we're specifically talking about more so in the future is managing and collaborating. Being able to pull the talent in your supply chain up with the level of talent that your own workforce, you know, it isn't uh, uh, an island anymore for a company to be uh, creating uh, its product for, for the world at large. It's a real collaborative, and in some cases we've heard stories where when uh, companies and countries, uh, and, and companies and companies in different countries compete they compete at a scale that's almost regional because the collaboration amongst the supply chain for that company on a regional basis, including its outreach to the educational institutions, is taken into consideration as they put their bid and their proposal together to get that job. Um, so the green manufacturing and sustainability uh, all kind of wraps around uh, eliminating waste and we can say that with just four letters these days. Lean, the principle is getting rid of the waste, and global engagement. So these were some of the success attributes that were looked at uh, from this group. Um, in our workforce perspectives, uh, as an organization, um, we're all about manufacturing and enhancing the ability of individuals and companies. Uh, so across the spectrum, uh, of these are almost like product lines, you know, our exhibits, uh, the kinds of certification and corporate training uh, are some of the research uh, activities that go on as well as the very pragmatic stuff on the communities, the conferences, um, the pipeline development, uh, journals, jobs. A lot of these are things that, you know, to some extent, um, societies embrace in that what you do in your institutions um, are close to uh, relating. So I did um, lose a few slides in the process, uh, so I apologize for that. But I was going to jump into four points because here we have an academic leadership group, and one of the things that, um, from, from the commercial about SME that you should know, I came here to say that what SME really does is it helps to have an impact on your filling the seats in the programs with quality students. So we do a lot in the outreach programs uh, to embrace the students in 
uh, all of the science, the technology, engineering, math stuff we have, some of the Gateway Academies, our partnership with Project Lead the Way and alike. Um, we're also engaged in industry relevant curricula um, because that's what our relationship is, is with members in industry. And uh, there's activities that we do that can help define no matter how you teach about manufacturing, whether it's as a degree program, whether it's as an option, whether it's a series of courses, or you integrate it across the spectrum of disciplines, uh, there are things about manufacturing that are important to know and they're reflected in some of the activity of our organization in uh, playing a role in that. And, and connecting to people, knowledge, and resources is a big part of why organizations exist. And we do an awful lot of making those connections in real time, face-to-face, -face, as well as in virtual environments. Um, I mentioned in uh, the youth programs, uh, we include student members, student chapters. Uh, I came here to talk to the Penn State folks um, and got them excited about the fact that, you know, you've got some really good students. We should be looking at the scholarships that you have. And our Education Foundation has numerous partnerships, uh, including um, an, a more recent one with the Gene Haas Foundation and machining technology. So we cover the spectrum of scholarships in engineering, engineering technology, and the like. Uh, developing industry-relevant curricula through our membership in ABET. We're, we're very active in writing and helping to revise and upgrade uh, program criteria. We're looking at the manufacturing engineering, and next will be the manufacturing engineering technology program criteria. And we were actually amongst the first of the societies that uh, some time ago when that program criteria got up and running uh, to have put on the table a draft of the manufacturing engineering technology criteria. Um, Credentials that distinguish. There's a lot of competition for jobs these days, and providing credentials is important from the technologist, the engineer, Six Sigma, Lean, and we are part of that systems view. The whole systems, uh, the certification system that NAM is endorsing, uh, SME is a partner in, and uh, you had heard Emily speak to that before and uh, not to undermine the importance of making those connections um, in a virtual environment to a real world environment. Uh, there are things that, that we do um, that are manufacturing focused to help make those connections to improve uh, the technologies and uh, that which you're really embracing um, and using a lot of new technologies to do that. Um, what I had wanted to also share with you, and I actually before the fire alarm, so I'm not sure if that's where my slides are, is some stream of uh, fire alarm noise, but we um, had done some things in, uh, I wanted to show particularly um, in defining or describing manufacturing engineering from manufacturing engineering technologists and from the manufacturing production technicians, and there were key words in there from what they were applying and to the extent of problem solving, the extent of relationships with customers and such um, that I thought would be helpful. And actually, if we get a chance, um, we can pull those out for part of the conversation later. And I apologize they weren't part of uh, these slides. Um, that, and I think just simply to say, um, our address, uh, we're headquartered in Dearborn, uh, the SME.org, and the SME.org uh, with the WFD gets you to the workforce development side and takes you to some of the clues about things that we do uh, relative to this conversation. So thank you for today's dialogue. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Mark. All right, now a little housekeeping work. Uh, we do have some time now for questions from you guys to talk with our panelists. Uh, but the, we are being videotaped, so you have to put your best face forward. And also, in order to make sure we get all the audio, if you have a question that you would like to pose for the panelists, what we need you to do is raise your hand, and then someone will come around with a microphone so that we can get uh, both the, the picture of the back of your head and your voice on the videotape. 
Uh, and so with that, I will open it to questions, and I see already Walt in the back. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, I've got a question to Mr. Kearney at Allegheny Power. You said you made a, a clear distinction between uh, uh, engineers and technology or, or technicians. Uh, I, when, during your remarks, I couldn't tell if you were, when you talked about a technician, if you were talking about a four-year uh, baccalaureate graduate engineer technology or not. Uh, we don't differentiate between a two-year and a four-year uh, technology graduate. Okay, because then you went on to talk about getting registered. So if a four-year grad got registered as a professional engineer, they still wouldn't be considered an engineer? No, sir. Well, yeah, even NSP, I think, would have a problem with that. So anyway, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank yes. you. Yeah, uh, my question is also for Mr. Kenny. Uh, from my experience, uh, the difference between engineering technology and, and engineers, it's really in the calculus or the math that it takes and the, you know, the physics. And so uh, let's say an engineering technology student takes the engineering math and takes the university of physics but gets an engineering <coughs> technology degree. Uh, will that change your mind about engineering technologies? It certainly could, yes. Uh, we, we review the curriculum frequently to determine what would, uh, would qualify a person to be an engineer in our corporation. Okay, um, so the, uh, if the curriculum expands itself into much more math and physics and, and some of the other theory of electricity, then yes, we would certainly consider that. Dushi, while you're walking over, I, I do have a question, and this is uh, for Reggie Brown. Uh, if I understood you correctly, this is a, an opportune time to get involved with this review of uh, job definitions and classifications, and if that's the case, I think a question a lot of us would like to have answered is, how, is it, uh, how would it be best for us to be involved in that process from the engineering technology uh, area? Yes, uh, is this working? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, what I was saying is that right now we have, uh, as you know, we've changed horses at the Office of Personnel Management. We have a new administration. And what happens is Director Barry is looking to implement civil service reform. A lot of our current structures that we have on how we go about determining uh, job series and the like uh, within the federal government ha came out of the Civil Service uh, Commission and a lot of those rules, regulations, and, and types of things are being re-examined and are gonna be re-examined under his tenure. One of the things that I was saying is that if there's a need for faster job classification, then that would be a good um, driver for you to come together. And, and again, um, the, the success will be dependent upon getting endorsement from one of the top 10 that I talked to, alluded to earlier, the Department of Defense, NASA, those guys to come on board with you to try to get those types of changes made because we want to be more, the Office of Personnel Management heretofore has been kind of slow in responding to those things. We want to be a lot more agile in doing that. Right now, when I uh, did the um, survey of the different agencies, there was not a lot of um, understanding, again, of the need for the engineering technology again, similar to what, what um, he, Thomas has said, um, is that we have technicians and we have um, engineers, and the people that actually go out and do the application are, are the technicians, and the people that are doing the actual theoretical type thing uh, get the engineering distinction. But again, for our, for our workforce of tomorrow to be efficient, we need to have that, and right now, <clears throat> this is our first time gaining the visibility of, of, of a, you know, a movement, so to speak towards that. So uh, what I would encourage is, is if you have some type of uniform body to come to us at the Office of Personnel Management and we'll engage with the Army Corps and NASA and the and Department of Defense and have some type of a joint forum. Great. Thank you. We'll start that dialogue. Sorry. Emily mentioned in her opening remarks about an index that was done that showed that um, parents would not encourage their children to do manufacturing. 
what, what message, what talking points do you propose to change that attitude? This is a, a multifaceted challenge with uh, lots of answers and responses underway. Um, and so let me just give you a few of them. Uh, first of all, um, we felt our job was to professionalize the careers in manufacturing, particularly at the entry level, to move away from the belief that what was left in America were the low end, um, dead end jobs. Uh, that's simply not true. So moving to the nationally portable industry recognized credentials, which aligned as post-secondary credentials with real value in the workplace that was going to result in broadened career opportunities and pathways for young people is one of the big steps forward. There are a number of uh, current career awareness campaigns reaching into middle and high schools. Um, our, our campaign, which is called Dream It, Do It, is, is in fact driven by manufacturers uh, and it is a recruitment strategy to get young people into the engineering technician, technologist, and engineer, full engineering pipeline. So uh, we're in 17 states now uh, with um, a, a new social media driven strategy that we'll be rolling out shortly. Uh, many of our colleague organizations have uh, everything from camps in the summer to um, internship opportunities, a whole host. Our job, I think, is to take all these promising, all these points of light, for those of you old enough to remember that, and um, <laughs> make sure it is a, you know, a constellation of changing the perception. Uh, unfortunately, engineers, I think in large measure, because it is manufacturers who hire them, that's where the jobs really are. And particularly when you think about my wheel, you know, everything's manufacturing to us, um, construction and energy and uh, biopharma, they're all on there. Um, what we're fighting are the front page news stories about every layoff, uh, the, um, the implications that uh, manufacturing <coughs> jobs no longer exist. In fact, there are 18 million manufacturing jobs in America today. It is still the business sector in our economy that has the highest salary and benefits, average, no, nothing competes, IT, healthcare, manufacturing jobs, and the facts about modern manufacturing, we actually just published two weeks ago a new um, just, uh, data-driven facts about modern manufacturing that needs to be used in our schools and with our parents particularly. So that's a, a big answer, I know, to a, a short question. I actually want to go back to you all with a question or a sorting factor that I think needs to be done, certainly from industry's perspective. What I'm hearing, and I hope your strategic discussions don't align this way, that we're talking about an engineering technology track. There is also this engineering technician thing rolling around, including with an SME credential. Um, and then there's engineer. Our world doesn't work like that in industry. Um, actually, I can't wait to actually, actually sit down and um, talk with Rich because the industry recognized credentials, the skill certifications that we look at are absolutely crossover between all facets of energy, construction, and advanced manufacturing. Career, they're not career ladders anymore, they're career lattices. And those lattices have to align with educational pathways to open more doors to your graduates. Tom, I think that in engineering particularly, both academe and quite frankly industry, have some very traditional ways of looking at their old job descriptions. And I love you, but the federal government is always the lagger, not the leader in this. So somebody's got, well, That's is there true. even a NAICS code anywhere? Really? No. Um, no, yeah. So if you're gonna lead in this area, then it is with, with industry driving, I would hope, and that's why again, I'm gonna say, I hope that message about nationally portable industry recognized skills credentials came through, because I'm telling you, we're dropping a bill on Capitol Hill that will direct 
that all of the Perkins money, the workforce investment money, and the trade adjustment assistance money for education for impacted workers goes only to those programs of study that result in industry-recognized skills credentials. And if we're successful, quite frankly, community colleges have kind of stepped up to the plate and they're gonna eat your lunch in the four-year programs. So, not to generate any controversy here, but. Um, <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a, that was a great question about, you know, how do you reach out to students? You know, what's the messages there? And uh, not long ago, it may have been uh, now over a year, the National Academy of Engineering published a report on changing the conversation. And if you look at that, the, the key takeaway is that the message has to resonate with your audience, not the people delivering it, <laughs> you know, who want to talk about things not necessarily relevant to your targeted audience, your future students and the like. Um, so it isn't conversations about how much money you can make, but more so it's how much you, the, the careers you prepare people for make a difference in the world, et cetera. And when you look at those, there's some very key messages that are relevant for engineering, engineering technologists, technicians alike, that you, I think, are, are wise to seek out and modify and adapt to your uses because you've, uh, as you well know, the new generations of students are far different than those that came before them. But Mark, all the research uh, against the millennial and the collaborative generation, although it highlights that they want to be global citizens and they want to make a contribution to the world, how much money am I going to make is number one. And it's why parents need to see against career pathways and lattices a progression in money. They, they, also, they have to be in the college culture. It's no good not to go to college, even if you don't need the college degree, you could get the job with a skills certification, which is why we're driving them together. So don't discount the money, it still ranks number one in all of the research. And one point also um, that you touched on is really true, is that, um, as I talked about before, the federal government has evolved and, and, and say grown into this big bureaucracy in many cases on how to get things done. And that's what we're trying to do with the reform. If there is a, a common standard so that we don't, I showed you the, the as I say, the dirty laundry over there with <clears> how <throat> specialized we can get. And, and that doesn't do any good as far as recruiting people when they have to go and spend, you know, 10 hours to do an application because we're getting it to get into those type of things. So if you have common core standards, common core uh, certification, that helps us because we're, again, trying to recruit people for the federal government as one of the, the priorities right now is trying to make government cool again because right now if, 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 if you go through our processes for getting hired, it normally takes about between six months and a year from the time that someone goes out and fills out an application until we come out with, the, with an offer and actually bring them on board. So as part of our reforms, we're trying to get to, to reduce that, getting rid of these things called the KSAs. I don't know if anyone's familiar with those type of things. So we can go to more of a resume-based type of um, you know, analysis for um, hiring and selection. So in, in keeping in line with those types of things, and we're doing that on the forefront, and then we have the, the backup that we go out and do, and, and do the actual certifications for the agencies that we have core requirements, what you're talking about, instead of all of these nuances that not only do you have to be a, a mic specialist, you have to be a mic specialist in silver mics as opposed to a mic specialist in, in, in bronze mics, it, it makes it a lot easier for us to also go in and attract folks. So we welcome, uh, again, getting back to the point to run, anything to simplify and clarify that. And then what happens is that once the federal government is, establishes, you know, we're kind of slow, it, as, as I said. But once we do that, then the state governments and everything, they kind of look to the federal government, and that but it just falls downhill from there. On our campus, we deal with eight different accrediting agencies right now. So in any given year, I have two or three on-site visits that I have to get ready for. Uh, hearing about more credentialing uh, is not something that really comes easy to me. But I'd like to ask the whole panel, what work have you done to have reciprocity between, say, ABET TAC, ABET Engineering, ABET to the Computer Accrediting side, and now, uh, you know, with the whole Life Science side? So we have to deal with all of those plus everybody else. I would hope that and the regional accrediting agencies at some point would give us a break 
so that we don't have to have nine or ten of these things and that we're all working uh, together. The other uh, que question or comment I'd like to hear you all talk about is there are three international protocols that set up technicians, technologists, and engineers. They, they're abs absolutely separate. When we're talking about globalization, I would think as we move into the global market, we're going to have to deal with how Europe and uh, other countries deal with that differentiation between engineers, technologists, and technicians. So even though we don't want to talk about it, and maybe your industries don't look at it that way, I think globally that actually is happening. And I'd like to hear your comments on that. I have, I have two. Um, again, speaking on behalf of the NAM endorsed skills certification system, in terms of um, number one, we are um, breaking into the accreditation um, uh, horror uh, through the integration of the skills credentialing in the associate degree programs now in North Carolina, Ohio, Washington State, and Texas, and um, having experience with getting to that accreditation in associate degree programs. It, they're both streamlined and the mapping to curriculum has been done in a way that we think will at least be a best practice in other areas. I know every regional body and state, you know, is different. The Minsky Chancellor is actually taking us um, into the ABET process for the broader context of accreditation um, of this skill certification system in a streamlined fashion, which could be applicable or at least provide a streamlined process across um, the post-secondary continuum. Uh, an organization that is associated with um, Pearson Education internationally uh, by the name of edXcel is taking the industry recognized skills credentials uh, across the pond, so to speak, um, because our global companies actually want to assure quality and consistency in the hiring of employees, whether they're in Bangladesh <coughs> or in Detroit. And the uh, third party assessed validated skills credentials is the only way they can get there because the school systems, the technical school systems, and the, the educational programs of study are so different. Uh, country by country. So it is the industry credentials to um, move into their s uh, systems that give some assurance to the global giants that they will get the same quality and consistency when they hire. All right, Mark, you get the last, well, all right, two last comments because Dushi's saying we've got to stay on schedule. Just, so Mark. Just relative to that question, ABIT's uh, International Accord is at the engineering accreditation level, but may provide a model to explore bringing it to an engineering technology accreditation kind of accord between nations on that. It takes the place of what was reciprocity, but it provides for that ease of entry of countries within that accord. All right, thank you. Let's give one last hand to the panel.